I am Sister Barbara Reed, President of Catholic Theological Union, and it is my great pleasure to welcome you to this panel discussion and memorial mass to honor the memory and ministry of our brother, Joseph Cardinal Bernadine, who died on this day in 1996, 25 years ago. If you're new to CTU, allow me to describe briefly who we are. Catholic Theological Union was formed in 1968 when three men's communities, the Passionists, Franciscans, and Servites, joined efforts to respond to the call to rethink seminary formation in the wake of Vatican II. And so CTU was founded in this urban context, close to the University of Chicago and other schools of theology, where we could easily engage in ecumenical, intercultural, and interreligious exchanges. Today, seminarians from 24 men's religious communities that are the corporate owners of the school make up 40% of our student body. Another 20% of our students are women religious. And 40% are lay women and men preparing for a great variety of ministries in the church. Our mission is to prepare effective leaders for the church, ready to witness to Christ's good news of justice, love, and peace. CTU was 14 years old when Joseph Bernardine became Archbishop of Chicago in 1982. He was a great friend and supporter of CTU, and it gave us great pleasure to establish the Bernardine Center at CTU with his blessing. For the past 25 years, the Bernardine Center has endeavored to continue the work that was so dear to the Cardinal's heart, reconciliation, peacemaking, dialogue, cultivation of church leadership, the pursuit of common ground, and affirming a consistent ethic of life. We are so pleased you are with us today to remember, to dialogue, to pray, and to continue to keep what Cardinal Bernardine taught us alive in our own work. I now invite Steve Millies, the director of the Bernardine Center, to introduce Here. our panel. This is Chicago. Mm -hmm. That's where Bernardine was, yeah. Thanks thank you very much, this. Sister Barbara. And uh, thanks to everyone uh, for joining us uh, either virtually online or here in this room. This is the first Bernadine Center event since we've been back from the pandemic, and it's a pleasure to see the tops of all your faces. <laughs> uh, we're going to move directly to the panel because we've got a very well-packed program here today. Uh, and so you've heard enough from me. Let me, uh, instead uh, of talking more, invite uh, our friend and our colleague up here, Michael J. O'Loughlin, National Correspondent for America Magazine and author of the forthcoming book, Hidden Mercy, AIDS, Catholics, and the Untold Stories of Compassion in the Face of Fear to step up and uh, offer a few remarks for today's program. I'll just add as well, uh, we're going to have a book launch in this room for Mike's book on December 10th. Uh, if you'd like some information about that, please feel welcome to be in touch. But for everything else, please welcome Mike. Uh, thank you, Steve. Um, it's so nice to see people uh, in person. Um, some friends here, a great turnout to celebrate Cardinal Bernadine's uh, life and legacy. And I will admit, I feel like a little bit of an imposter up here because I did not know Cardinal Bernadine. Um, I'm not from Chicago. I moved here about seven years ago. But he's a figure in the church I've always known about a little bit, sort of uh, his leadership um, in encouraging dialogue and fostering peace, uh, encouraging uh, healing divisions in the church. He's someone I knew a little bit about, but it wasn't really until a few years ago when I was deep into my research about the Catholic Church's response to HIV and AIDS that I really began to learn more about Cardinal Bernadine's ministry and his style of leadership. And I thought I would share uh, an anecdote from uh, my forthcoming book in which Cardinal Bernadine played a central role. Uh, in the book, I make a point to set up the context of what was the Catholic Church's response to HIV and AIDS in the 1980s and 90s. And an important part of that context is 
laying out the institutional church's response, which in many ways was quite negative. Uh, there, this was a time when the Vatican was cracking down on the gay rights movement in the church. You had Catholic bishops in many places in the United States fighting against gay civil rights bills. Uh, you had some uh, bishops and other church leaders even trying to undermine public health campaigns because of the church's opposition to condoms. But against that context, there were Catholics doing heroic and groundbreaking ministry in healthcare, in pastoral care to people with HIV and AIDS. And that's really what I focus on in the book is what were the good works being undertaken by Catholics throughout the country? But setting up some context is important. Uh, the, the anecdote I'm gonna focus on today takes place in 1987. This is a point in history where more than 40,000 Americans had died from age-related complications. A poll taken that year found 43% of Americans believe that AIDS might be a punishment from God aimed at gay men. So the stigma around HIV and AIDS was very real and very prevalent in the country. Now, many bishops around the United States had issued statements about HIV and AIDS, and there was a somewhat underground network of Catholics involved in HIV and AIDS ministry. But to his credit, Cardinal Bernadine wanted a more robust response from the National Bishops Conference. He thought that sporadic statements coming out in different dioceses wasn't enough. At this point, Pope John Paul II still had not released a statement about HIV. This was five years into the epidemic. So Cardinal Bernadine worked behind the scenes to encourage his brother bishops to take the epidemic more seriously and figure out how the institutional church could respond to the growing crisis. So he worked behind the scenes in the, in, at the bishops' conference and was able to get bishops to agree that they would draft a letter about HIV and AIDS. And the goal was to answer a few questions. First, what kind of public policy should the church be advocating when it comes to HIV and AIDS? What forms of education were appropriate for Catholics? There was a movement in the country to teach uh, students, high school and older, about ways to protect themselves from the spread of HIV. And there was a debate in the church about how Catholic schools should be engaged in that conversation. And then third, how could the church contribute to the wider conversation about AIDS? This was an attempt to be public facing, to take part in the public dialogue about this national crisis. So bishops began work on this letter in 1987. Uh, they spent several months researching. They consulted experts from uh, medicine and science, Catholic and non-Catholic to make sure that they really understood what, what was happening uh, around this conversation. The letter is released in 1987. It becomes public in December. And really what it does is it reiterates the viewpoints that many church leaders had already been promulgating uh, on their own. It's called The Many Faces of AIDS, and it includes case studies of firsthand experience uh, from people living with HIV, from caregivers, from theologians, ethicists, pastoral care providers. And it has uh, more or less five main points. It says society must do more to help those living in poverty who are also confronting HIV. It reminds people of the link between economic hardship and behaviors that put people at risk for HIV, such as IV drug use, and urges more understanding about that relationship. It encourages Catholic hospitals to continue uh, exploring how they can do more to serve vulnerable populations. Uh, it reiterates the church's view on human sexuality. Uh, it says that sex needs to be reserved to marry heterosexual couples open to life, which is a nod at the church's uh, stance against condoms and artificial birth control. And it also casts doubt on efforts to incorporate HIV education in public schools. So it was pretty standard. There were calls for compassion. That was the goal of the letter, but very traditional when it came to Catholic teaching on sexuality. But there was also a provision in the document, and I think this is where we can see Cardinal Bernadine at work here, where there was a willingness to engage the world, to partner with organizations that maybe didn't share the church's exact view on human sexuality, that thought listening to public health officials who urged the use of condoms to fight the spread of HIV, that Catholic organizations could partner with those kinds of organizations if it achieved a common goal of helping people who were facing uh, life with HIV. That small bit, and it's, it's really just a very small section of a rather lengthy document, it set off a firestorm of public criticism from other bishops. New York's Cardinal John O'Connor took issue with the letter and called a press conference to 
state his opposition to that particular provision in the document. He rallied other bishops to come out against this document uh, and joined him in the campaign. Uh, interestingly, his allies included Cardinal Bernard Law of Boston, Archbishop Theodore McCarrick of Newark, and together they formed this public opposition and this public rift among US bishops. It was unusual to have bishops disagreeing publicly to air their grievances in public like that. It was another uh, battle in the, it was another battle in the ongoing confrontation between Cardinal Bernadine and Cardinal O'Connor who seemed to be on the ascendant side of the Catholic hierarchy. This rose to the level where Rome actually decided to get involved. They initially did not want to intervene in what they saw as a US issue, uh, but Cardinal Ratzinger at the CDF eventually released a statement urging bishops to take another look at the document to remind them what church teaching was when it came to the use of condoms. And Pope John Paul II even weighed in and urged them to keep a dialogue going. So behind closed doors, Cardinal Bernadine realized he had lost that this kind of openness to the world on this issue was not going to stand. So the bishop spent two years working on another document, uh, which was released in late 1989. It was entitled Call to Compassion. And that second document repeated many of the same themes from the first one, but it was unflinching in its critique of public health campaigns that promoted condoms. It said it was poor and in inadequate advice. Now, Cardinal Bernadette made sure that the first document was never retracted. So if you're kind of keeping score, that document that shows his openness and willingness to engage the world still stood, but the second document was much more inward facing. It was addressed to Catholics rather than all Americans. Uh, the religion scholar, Anthony Petro, who teaches religion at Boston University, he saw in this a pretty seismic shift in how the Catholic Church in the United States engaged the world. He said the first document was an attempt to show that the church could be a partner in the public square, that it could uh, be uh, an organization that could work with others, even if they didn't always agree, that common goals were more important than doctrinal purity. And that the second document, only two years later, was an inward facing document, one that sort of uh, showed that the church was more concerned with its own members rather than being a partner in, in, in the public square. Now, Steve asked that we be forward looking. Now this is obviously all backward looking, but I do have a new book about history coming out in two weeks. So that's where my <laughs> mind is. But I, I did want to think a little bit about what this particular story, which has stuck with me, shows us um, and I think it offers us a model for how we can engage with the messiness of lived experiences. I think uh, that's a theme that will come up today is Cardinal Brandine was not afraid of the world. He was intent on engaging with uh, all kinds of people with different viewpoints. What can we learn from one another? What can we share with one another? And on this particular crisis, HIV and AIDS, he was willing to say there are organizations out there who are doing good work in this field. And we don't all have the same values or same beliefs, but if we can work together toward a shared goal, it's worth undertaking that work together. He didn't waver from church teaching. The first document I mentioned that he had a hand in uh, crafting and didn't waver from church teaching. Like I said, it was quite traditional, but he was willing to figure out where those shared values might overlap with other organizations, even if there wasn't total agreement on that. So looking forward, I'm headed to Baltimore this week uh, to cover the meeting of the US Conference of Catholic Bishops. And there is uh, the possibility there'll be a debate about Catholic politicians. Are they uh, able to receive communion if they hold views that are at odds with the Catholic Church? Um, it seems that maybe they're backing off from what they had proposed earlier this year in June, that maybe the communion wars won't be as intense as we once feared they would be. But there does seem anyway included in that conversation to be a reticence to engage the world, a sort of defensive posture that we have to retreat. And I can't help but think what would be lost both to our church and to our society if Catholics did retreat from public life. My research has been on Catholics who did amazing heroic pastoral ministry during HIV and AIDS, and I can't imagine what would have been lost both for the church and for individuals they ministered to if they saw the messiness of life at that time and decided to retreat. 
I think we'd all have been for, for it. And I think there's still lessons to be learned from Cardinal Bernadine's advocacy during this time. Thank you. Thank you for that, Mike. And uh, I do want to say that it had uh, struck me before we got here that uh, we are certainly here uh, to remember Cardinal Bernadine today, uh, but a co-star of today's program certainly will be the city of Baltimore. Uh, a name uh, that I think will be repeated many times throughout the course of the afternoon, including right now, as I welcome our next speaker, uh, who is joining us from the city of Baltimore, uh, here through the miracle of these times that we live in now, uh, that we can be joined uh, live uh, by Gloria Purvis, uh, the host of the Gloria Purvis podcast from America Media. Would you please give her a good welcome that's loud enough to be heard in Baltimore from the south side of the Gloria. Thank you. Thank you so much. You know, uh, I have to say, Cardinal Bernadine wasn't someone that I knew growing up, even though I too am from the state of South Carolina, a Catholic from South Carolina, and he served in my diocese, the Diocese of Charleston. But I do remember some years ago coming across a YouTube video of the press conference in which he was taking questions from the press um, when he was accused of sexual abuse by a former seminarian. And one of the reporters asked him a very personal question. And I just remember thinking, boy, the nerve to, to ask him. He asked him basically if he was sexually active. And the Cardinal, I just remember how he paused in this video that I watched. It was a, re, you know, a recorded video much after when he had given it, that uh, he stopped and said he had been a chaste and celebrate priest for the entire time of his priesthood. And there was something just so remarkable in his openness, his vulnerability, and his witness, really. And when I had come to learn more about how he dealt with being falsely accused, number one, that he had already in his um, an Archdiocese of Chicago had had guidelines put in place for these kinds of occasions if a priest was accused. And he didn't exempt himself from going through the process. He immediately reported himself, if you will, to the review board so that they could start an investigation. And given all that's happened in the last seven or so years in the church, I just thought that was uh, remarkable. And then further, he did not bear any ill will against the young man who had accused him. In fact, he said he felt like he needed to pray for him, that he wanted to reach out for him. And then when it came out that the allegations were not, they were false. The Cardinal met with the young man and didn't, wasn't enraged, but just wanted to reconcile with him and offered a holy mass right there on the spot for this young man who had been, who had said he had trouble with the church after his negative experience in seminary and being abused. And so he'd been far away from the sacrament, but the Cardinal says, do you, would you let me celebrate mass? And the young man cried and they did. And then he talks further about later on the young man dying reconciled to the faith. And that even though he had been accused of a false, you know, falsely. He didn't want to pursue a scorched earth policy and countersued young man. Why? Because he didn't want to deter people who had actually been abused from coming forward. And I just thought, what, what a beautiful uh, way to always be thinking of someone else. And in terms of thinking of someone else, I also thought it was remarkable how he, even though he had been a bishop at the time, he asked young priests who he had ordained, you know, I need some help with my prayer life. I, I'm just not doing it, you know, like I should. All these other things are coming into, into, you know, getting my attention. And so the young men, I suppose, at least the way the Cardinal tells it, were very frank and basically saying, look, you got to practice what you preach. What do you mean you're not praying? So from that point forward, he decided to get up an hour earlier and give that hour to the Lord, even if his mind was wandering, even if he just, you know, was having difficulty, that hour would belong to the Lord, no one else, because he realized prayer was more important than doing good works. In fact, prayer probably is what gives you the ability to do good works. Why? Because you have developed a relationship with Jesus. And I thought that also was very profound because that came into play for him as he dealt with the accusations and then dealt with his cancer diagnosis. And one of the things that he talked about as well is that praying when you're healthy sustains you when you're too sick to be able to pray. 
And as someone that is with the Carmelite, follows the Carmelite charism of praying to see God's face, that spoke immensely, that spoke so much to me. And I thought that was so true. And I also thought that it was interesting that as he talks about the end of his life and his challenges, he doesn't talk about his brother bishops. <laughs> <laughs> he he <laughs> used them as, the, as, as, as an issue, even though, you know, I had, had read some about all the bickering and, you know, seemingly to the paint the paint him as, or at least his understanding of the consistent life ethic as not so good, the kind of discussions that were going on anyway. But he didn't count that as an issue. He counted the false accusation and his cancer as two things that were most concerning to him but neither in a kind of bitter way either. And the way in which the Cardinal seemed to deal with adversity is he never seemed to be bitter. And in fact, when those opportunities allowed him, he tried to get closer to the people involved in the case of the young man, Stephen Cook, and also with fellow cancer patients at the hospital and those facing serious illnesses. And that was something that he talks about is the priest isn't really to be a politician. The priest is to be someone to be with the people, intimately with the people, to walk with them in their struggles, in their darkness, in their trials, not to run away, but to be there with them. And I think those are very important words for the church today, um, especially as we're dealing with so much polarization, which he also talked about polarization and division. He could see that that is something that would be a problem and we need to find areas of commonality. I mean, as Catholics, our faith unites us. We should be able to speak to each other and love each other and understand that we're coming from the place of belief in whatever it is that we're trying to do and let that be what unites us instead of the kind of divisions that I think have been all too evident as of late in the church. And I also think with the Cardinals, being able to set out for us the consistent life ethic is very important. And I think we still need to figure out how to model it as Catholics. How do we, uh, at the same time, believe about life in the womb and life being protected from the womb to the tomb and not get caught up in the middle part? Because it seems like today we are really struggling with understanding the dignity of the human person outside the womb, particularly in areas of race, immigration, uh, sexual orientation, all of these things somehow we seem to struggle with accepting this basic truth about our faith. And I think the Cardinal offers at least uh, in, his, in his book and in, in laying out the consistent ethic of life, something that we need to really deeply engage with. I, I think it's something that we as Catholics in the United States just don't yet know how to do that. Um, it seems like we've been pulled in the areas of politics, influencing how we understand church teaching rather than the other way around. And I think the Cardinal has some good exact advice and, and good behavior modeling, I think, modeling behavior for how we need to be as Catholics in this area. And especially with being able to have common ground with people who even may not agree with us on everything, but in areas where we can work together, we should. And to me, that shows a strength of faith, if you will, that he was not fearful that working with people who may disagree with us in other areas would somehow lead to us not believing what we already believe. And I think that means he also wasn't fearful. I mean, like Michael said, he wanted to engage with the world. And I don't see how we can be Catholic and not engage with the world. I think it's a part of the, the gospel call to be engaged with the world, to serve people, to love people, to walk with people, even if they don't believe like we do, because of what we believe is what causes us to do this, not the other way around. They don't have to believe like us for us to be with them and to love them and to walk with them and to work together with them. And I think that's an especially important message as we look in the areas of racial justice right now in the United States because it seems to be extremely polarizing and we want almost a sort of purity test for those people who wanna pursue racial justice as if the goal, and of the goal itself isn't enough. That we can't work together with people that might disagree with us on other areas, to me seems strange, just strange. 
And I think the way the Cardinal has laid things out that we can do, that we can work with people, have common ground is very important. I hope that we recapture that and emphasize that and give people confidence that you can do this without losing your soul. So uh, to me, there's been so much that the Cardinal has done and written that's really important for us to remember and celebrate. And of course, as a fellow child of South Carolina, I've got that Carolina pride too for our Cardinal. Gloria, thank you for that. And you know, though I'm from here, I'll, I'll join you in that. I lived for 15 years in South Carolina. It's one of the things that brought me here uh, by a strange path, but that's a story for another time. Uh, rather than talk about that, let's instead talk about the fact that we, as I say, live in a miraculous time when we can hear Gloria Purvis with us all the way from Baltimore, Maryland in real time. And yet we also can fly Julie Hanlon Rubio uh, here to Chicago to join us in person. Uh, we, we live in a multimodal environment. Uh, and so we're grateful for Julie uh, being with us today, a professor of Christian social ethics at the Jesuit School of Theology at Santa Clara University. Julie, would you please say a few words? Please welcome Julie. I am so happy to be here with you today. On this 25th anniversary of Cardinal Bernadine's death, it, it coincides with the first anniversary of Pope Francis's Fratelli Tutti, which tries to get us to love beyond those to whom we feel connected. But it also comes in this year, this year where our politicians barely passed legislation to deal with the existential threat of climate change and still can't pass legislation on things as basic as sick leave or family leave. And we have been arguing nonstop about masks and vaccinations and gathering and everything else. The Catholic Common Ground Initiative has never been easy, but this seems an especially troubling time to think about its future. But I am a fan. <laughs> and so I wanna talk to you this afternoon about three ways that we might carry that, like, that part of his legacy forward. So first, seeking common ground despite the challenges. The legacy of working to heal divides in the church that Cardinal Bernadine left behind means a lot to me and I'm sure to many of us gathered in the room today. We remember and celebrate the ways that Cardinal Bernadine listened to Catholics talk about controversial issues and gathered bishops and lay people, influential lay people for what we now call difficult dialogues. My interest in Common Ground goes back a little further to my senior year in college. 35 years ago this weekend, my husband and I started dating. And that began a long argument, or should I say difficult dialogue, <laughs> our, because our, we were formed in very different Catholic homes. His was marked by Ronald Reagan, Operation Rescue, and This Rock. Mine by JFK, Hans Kung, and the Berrigan brothers. And that gave us a lot to talk about. <laughs> I learned that politics and religion were more complicated than I was raised to believe. That I could love and share a great deal with someone whose vote canceled out mine. And when I became a theologian, I was drawn to thinkers whose views challenged mine and to projects that mapped the overlap between the sides. I had the privilege of being part of the annual gathering of the Catholic Common Ground Initiative when the topic was sex and the conversation was, I believe, particularly heated. To be honest, there was a moment when I walked out. One afternoon, I had to leave and go for a walk. I, the difficulty of working through differences became too much and I just had to have space to breathe. But I came back. <laughs> And knowing that many involved in the Catholic Common Ground Initiative and similar projects had been coming back year after year gave me inspiration to keep going. My experience teaching undergrads at St. Louis University and graduate students at JST has pushed me to figure out how to get people to talk to each other across differences. And because I had experience with a group of theologian friends committed to leaving behind the divides of the generation before us, and instead trying to gather to talk and eat and pray and write, I knew it was possible. Some argue that today we should stop putting energy into common ground efforts because very little can be accomplished. It's just not worth it. But like Cardinal Bernadine, I'm not convinced. Often what is needed is just a different kind of conversation. 
while debates and debunking and even dialogue centered on controversial issues can be ineffective, shifting the question sometimes can work. For instance, climate change activist, um, sorry, scientist Catherine Hayhoe notes that although there's ongoing division among people when you ask questions about the extent of the threat of climate change, when asked if we should be working on alternative energy development and reducing our consumption, nearly everyone says yes. And the Yale Climate Change Project has discovered that getting people to connect with the emo their emotions around the natural spaces they love and giving them a better sense of what actions matter and how much, that's way more helpful than citing lots of depressing scientific studies and trying to get them to change their minds. In moral theology, we found that focusing on virtue, what kind of person do I want to become? What habits do I need to cultivate to become more of that kind of person? That opens up space that talking about sin doesn't. In family ethics, my field, for instance, by bracketing contentious issues and pursuing new questions like, what does it mean to parent well? How can families think better about work and time, food and money? We can talk despite our differences. I see no reason to abandon the work of seeking common ground now. Second, we, we need to rethink the virtues that we need for this work. In his last book that Gloria spoke about, The Gift of Peace, the Cardinal speaks movingly about the process of letting go. And he contrasts centering his own desires for his life with giving over control to God, a process he learned through trials, daily prayer, and being a cancer patient. The Catholic Common Ground Initiative was conceived during a period of his cancer remission. And although he does not, to my knowledge, ever link letting go with common ground, it seems like the, the connection is there. To commit to dialogue across deep, deep disagreement is to let go of my preconceived notions of others and my own certainties. It's to be open to asking real questions, to sharing and to listening to the backstories behind people's positions, believing there's a path when you can't really see what that path is, seeing not just the humanity of the other person, but also my own fright my own failures and limits. But, and this is a crucial, but the virtues linked to letting go like humility and vulnerability have to be paired with the virtues of truth telling, just anger, and what moral theologian Jim Keenan calls a vir the virtue, the new cardinal virtue of self care. When Cardinal Bernadine first announced the initiative, the criticism came from conservatives anxious that truth would be papered over with tolerance. But today, the criticism is more likely to come from the left. Common ground is associated with meeting in the middle where justice may not be, with placing civility and politeness over speaking truth to power, with asking people on the margins to spend valuable energy explaining once again why their lives matter to people who just don't get it. In Seeking Common Ground, we have to say um, that Cardinal Bernardine's critics weren't completely wrong to worry about truth, right? Finding common ground doesn't mean giving up on truth or believing truth lies in the middle of opposing views. Not everyone is called to the demanding work of common ground. Some Black, Latinx, Asian, LGBTQ, feminist Catholics are tired of charged conversations on issues that shape their daily lives. We need to say not only be humble and let go, but stand up, say no, love yourself. We can remember that Cardinal Bernadine not only initiated common ground, but also stood up prophetically when theologian, feminist theologian Elizabeth Johnson's tenure case was on the line. He was both prophet and bridge builder. Finally, much in Bernadine's vision encourages us to look beyond differences to what unites us as Catholics and human beings, to engage each other in dialogue. And Pope Francis promotes dialogue too in Evangelii Gaudium, and he modeled it in the Synods on the Family. And in Fratelli Tutti, he asks us to love beyond, to seek our connectedness to others beyond our family, culture, or nation, to break down the walls that divide us. But are we sure we know which walls we're talking about? Sometimes we don't know each other well enough to really say. When black and immigrant Catholics are included, the picture of the US church is more diverse, less polarized, less easy to characterize as right or left. 
Sociologist uh, Tricia Bruce's work on Catholic parishes shows that the vast majority of parishes are ideologically diverse. Most of us actually don't parish shop. We just go to the one down the street. So we're enmeshed in diverse communities, but even still, we may not actually know each other. The divisions among us may have less to do with sex and gender, war and abortion. They may be about other things. And even then, it's probably more complicated than our echo chambers suggest. So to do common groundwork today, we need to make sure we're seeing each other in our complexity. And we've got to get up close to do that. Encounter is the only way to do that. And that's where the work that Cardinal Bernardin started can help us. The listening sessions he held were so important. But our version might be different. Lay people will leave. Work in common may be part of the process because the research shows that working side by side with people we disagree with is more effective than dialogue at breaking down walls. For example, at my former parish, St. Francis Xavier in St. Louis, the anti-racism work has brought several parishes in the same deanery who never before talked to each other to gather and go for walks through our shared neighborhoods, visit each other's parishes. And there was even a play co-written by women in, in the communities about growing up black and Catholic, which highlighted both great similarities and painful differences. As we envision the next 25 years of common groundwork, I hope for ongoing commitment, for a mix of humility and truth telling, for a willingness to encounter each other. Instead of looking beyond the walls we assume are locked in place, let's eat and walk and find new places we can work together. Building the church Cardinal Bernadine wanted us to, so wanted us to have from the ground up. Thank you so much for that very rousing and I think uh, timely call to dialogue, a subject I feel confident we're going to come back to. Uh, and in fact, in the spirit of coming to that conversation, as uh, Sister Barbara Reed mentioned in her introduction, interreligious dialogue is an important part of life at the Bernadine Center, our mission, as well as here at Catholic Theological Union. Uh, since we opened our doors in 1968, uh, we have been engaged in Catholic Jewish dialogue here at CTU, a thing we're very, very proud of indeed. Uh, and it's in that spirit uh, that we uh, welcome uh, Professor Malka Zeiger Simkovich, the Crown Ryan Chair of Jewish Studies and the Director of our Catholic Jewish Studies program to reflect a little bit on interreligious dialogue uh, in the light of Cardinal Bernadine's legacy. I should add, Malka came here all the way from the fifth floor. Uh, so yeah. we've had... <laughs> True. Malka, would you please, and please welcome Malka. I'm honored to be a part of this event, and I want to thank my wonderful colleague, Dr. Steve Millies, uh, Mr. Peter Cunningham, who's standing by the door greeting everybody, and many others uh, at Catholic Theological Union for making this afternoon a reality. As a proud member of the Bernadine Center, I'm aware of how much work goes into an event like this, and I want to recognize the extraordinary effort that has gone into all the details of this event to make it run so smoothly. I would like to speak briefly about Cardinal Bernadine's legacy of reconciliation in the context of interreligious dialogue. And I'll share with you some thoughts regarding where we are holding today in this dialogue and what areas continue to require, I think, some special attention. Cardinal Bernadine began his tenure as the Archbishop of Chicago in August of 1982 when the turn towards interreligious reconciliation in the wake of the Second Vatican Council was still new and mostly informal. He began his position as Archbishop during a time of social upheaval in the United States, and there were plenty of other things to pay attention to that would have legitimately diverted his attention from what many Catholics might have viewed as abstract and impractical debates about interreligious relationships. Social crises and controversies regarding AIDS, abortion, contracept uh, contraception, and other issues were in varying degrees at the foreground of the spaces where politics and religion intersected in the lives of Catholic Americans. And yet, while Cardinal Bernadine could have ignored the far less immediate matter of interreligious relationships, he made it a priority to bring the teachings of the Second Vatican Council to his constituents with confidence with clarity, 
And he went out of his way to cultivate warm relationships between his archdiocese in Chicago and other faith communities in the Midwest, particularly with the Jewish community. Part of the reason for, for why Bernadine's legacy regarding interreligious relations is so significant is that in the mid 80s, 25 years after the Second Vatican Council came to a close, there was not yet a clear path forward in terms of how Catholics were expected to interpret and apply a statement which came to be known as Nostra Aetate that was produced in 1965 with the Second Vatican Council. This lack of clarity was partly due to what seemed like intentional ambiguity in the document. On the one hand, Nostra Aetate proclaimed that, quote, the Catholic Church rejects nothing that is true and holy in other religions. And it stated that regard, it regards with sincere reverence those ways of conduct and of life, those precepts and teachings, which, though differing in many aspects from the one she, the church, holds and sets forth, nonetheless, often reflect a ray of that truth, which enlightens all men. And yet, the statement went on to say that the church must proclaim Christ the way, the truth, and the life, in whom men may find the fullness of religious life, in whom God has reconciled all things to himself. In other words, people outside the Christian faith can find a path towards truth and salvation, but Contradictorily, this truth lies and must lie within the specific and very particular recognition of Christ. How to square the circle. <laughs> this ambiguity was especially acute when it came to the Jewish people in the document's famous fourth paragraph, which insisted that, quote, God holds the Jews most dear for the sake of their fathers. He does not repent of the gifts he makes or of the calls he issues and that the Jews should not be presented as rejected or accursed by God. But what did it mean to hold the Jewish people most dear? Was the Jewish covenant equal and parallel to the Christian covenant? Debates regarding how to interpret this famous line and the statement more broadly continue to animate Catholic theological discourse today. One of the great legacies of Cardinal Bernadine lies in his effort to clarify these and other ambiguities not by waving them away, but by leaning into them and by proactively insisting that the traditional Christian mission of the pre-Second Vatican world had to be actively replaced by efforts to reach across the aisle and enter into dialogue on the premise that all people are entitled to dignity, to self-definition, and to self-determination. Cardinal Bernadine unequivocally read Nostra Aetate as a statement which mandated that all Catholics work towards friendship with all people on the basis of their common right to dignity, and in the case of the Jewish people, on the basis as well of the need to face the church's dark history of anti-Jewish oppression and persecution. Though Bernadine was radically optimistic about the future, he gave impassioned speeches up until his death, which declared that there was much more work to be done in the field of interreligious friendship. Any evaluation of Bernadine's legacy must consider whether the interreligious dialogue that he worked to foster is in a better position than it was 25 years ago. Indeed, much has changed and very little has changed. The church still lives in the baby stages of a new era of interreligious friendship with other faith communities. And I once spoke with Father John Polakowski about how many years he thinks uh, it'll take for the teachings of Nostra Aetate to trickle down into the church and he thought, he said, I think about 500 years. So I thought, that's a really long time to wait, <laughs> but we'll remain optimistic. Uh, the teachings of Nostra Aetate and the documents produced in the 70s and 80s about how to interpret Nostra Aetate remain unknown to many Catholics, both among lay people and among trained clergy. The lack of awareness of Nostra Aetate, I think, is especially problematic in regards to Jewish Christian relations, since without Nostra Aetate and a proper historical education, uh, Christian scriptures, liturgy, and the lectionary might fuel anti-Jewish teachings, which present Jew Jesus as working against Jewish values and not within them. The recent attention on the part of church leadership to cultivate an intercultural orientation that serves the needs of churches in diverse settings is undoubtedly a great thing in itself. This focus has not yet addressed the question of how to offer all Catholic communities practical guidelines with which to engage outside religions. 
From the perspective of the Jewish community, this is especially problematic as Catholic communities in the global north shrink and Catholic communities in the global south expand and direct exposure to Jewish people in Catholic communities diminishes rather than grows. With this diminishing exposure is a decreased knowledge of contemporary Judaism in all of its varieties and complexities, and a correlating perhaps decreased interest in maintaining, nurturing, and growing Jewish-Christian relations as a distinct and unique relationship. Uh, I'm the first Jew that many of my students meet, and I worry very much that I will be the last Jew that many of my students meet. They come into my classes, some of them with certain ideas about Judaism, both in terms of ancient Judaism and modern, and they leave, I hope, with the understanding that the Judaism that they've engaged with all their lives might just be a symbol and not the pulsating, living, and evolving reality of Judaism that I know and that other Jews know. Cardinal Bernadine understood this dissonance, and he recognized that every Catholic needs to encounter living Judaism. I believe that we need to return to Cardinal Bernadine's work in the 1980s and not simply to enact dialogue, but to actively make a case for why it's worth the investment. Cardinal Bernadine knew that making this case includes the recognition that while a peaceful interreligious inter relationship can be established by dissolving or ignoring boundaries, a truly rich and substantive interreligious friendship can only be nourished by recognizing the boundaries and the singular ideas and histories that make us who we are. Cardinal Bernadine therefore advocated for speaking with people outside of one's faith community rather than speaking about them and insisted that all people are entitled to the dignity to self-define and to draw their own boundaries. For Cardinal Bernadine, every interreligious relationship had to be protected, nurtured, and invested in. The question now is, will the Catholic community heed the Cardinal's call to action made 25 years ago and more by, implement, by implementing the teachings of the Second Vatican Council and using it to combat all forms of social and religious hatred? If the Cardinal were with us today, I believe that he would gently remind us that what is still broken can still be fixed and that we must fix it. Thank you. Also, thank you so much for that reflection uh, and, and thanks to the whole panel. In a moment, uh, I'm going to claim a moderator's privilege and ask a couple of questions of our panel. Uh, both here and far, uh, to try to get a conversation started underway. Uh, but before I do that, I want to remind all of you who are here in the room with us, as well as those who are joining us from far away, uh, that we'd like to spend some time uh, talking about what you'd like to talk about, answering your questions. Here in the room, uh, you received those question slips on your seats when you came in. Uh, far away, uh, we can take your questions by way of chat. I have a handy device right here that will help me do that. Uh, so as we get our conversation underway up here, uh, please uh, let us know what questions you have, and we'll try to get to as many of them as we can uh, before the end. In about five minutes here in the room, members of our staff will pass up and down the aisles, just pass those questions to them, and they'll discreetly transmit them to me up here. And again, for those who are joining us from far away, uh, please uh, just go ahead and uh, put your questions into the chat. And in a little while, I'll do my best to try to get as many questions answered here as I possibly can. Boy, uh, panel, I want to thank all of you uh, for, uh, so everybody knows, uh, I, I purposefully embarked on this with no prearrangement about this conversation at all. Uh, I thought if we uh, entrust this conversation to Cardinal Bernadine and the Holy Spirit, uh, everything's going to work out just fine. Uh, and lo and behold, here we are. I think in many ways we've all talked about the same thing. It's 25 years later. Uh, it's 2021. Uh, and yet all around us, rising Islamophobia, rising anti-Semitism, open racism, more and more in our culture and in our world, bitter divisions of all kinds, down to the level of the simplest, most elemental public health questions, the sorts of things that should not require much argument at all. What's happened? Uh, <laughs> yeah, I do want you to answer that, but let me try to help you out a little bit. Um, 
I, I think we have to deal with that. And I like something Malka asked toward the end. I wonder if part of it is our fault, not just Catholics, but those of us who feel the call to dialogue and understand the importance of civility and walking with the other. Is it that we've made, failed to make the case that we need to embark on this, to persist in that optimism despite the many challenges that we're confronted with? that we need to uh, engage in dialogue with the world despite whatever disagreements we might have and search for common ground. Is the question really so simple? Uh, and you know, I don't wanna say it's because Cardinal Bernadine left us and we lost an advocate for these kinds of things 25 years ago, it's more complicated than that. But is the question really so simple that we just haven't made the case and we need to make the case? And I, I would just welcome whatever pops into your heads about. Um, oh, of course. Gloria. So yeah, I, you know, I, I tend to think honestly that there's so much introspection that the church needs to do in her role in a lot of these things, racism, I mean, the church's history there, just, I think we've failed to do our own introspection, to look at our own wounds. And then I also think that we haven't been as diligent as we need to do to be in terms of praying and fasting around these issues and being willing also to, how, what's, the, what's the word I wanna use? To not be so caught up with having temporal power. I really sometimes look at some of the things that we say and do in the church and we are so fearful that if so-and-so is not elected to some position <laughs> in the government, that, oh my gosh, it's all over. And I think having that kind of fearful reaction and, um, being uh, cowed by the idea of not being in political power has given a poor witness um, as believers. Either we believe Jesus Christ is on the throne or we don't. Either we're willing to follow him in times where we are not in power or popular or any of that or we're not. So I think um, the church has to do some focusing and it does have to come to, to account for and talk to people about where we have, where we've failed. The sex abuse scandal, all of that, comes into hurting our ability to be able to proclaim the gospel. So I would think those are the kinds of things that we need to do uh, if we wanna have a clearer voice in the public square. If I could build on that, I, I, I would agree that we need to look at the church's failures, um, especially in being a witness for common ground. That, that I, I don't think many people would look to the Catholic church and think, oh, they're showing us how to do it well. <laughs> Right. Uh, so when when we let worries um, of of cooperation essentially with with the sinful other get in the way of of eating with them, let alone talking or working with them, then then we're doing it wrong. Um, so there's that. I, I I also think a lot of people have very bad experiences um, in their families and their communities, and they get with um, with dialogue of this kind. And so they just learn to avoid it. They learn that the best thing is to be polite and say nothing controversial. Uh, and so it takes a lot in the classroom and in other spaces to, to make, to allow people to feel safe enough um, to be, to enter into that conversation and to give that the confidence that, that it can really happen. But on the, but I do think that once you do that, you really open people up. And I see, um, I was on the, uh, the a Jesuit higher education board for a while and got to travel around to a number of different Jesuit campuses and saw students themselves taking the lead and doing their own. And they didn't you know, necessarily name it anything, um, but they were just start their own conversations in the dorms and elsewhere uh, because they knew that the, their adult mentors weren't doing it well. And sometimes they would say, yeah, our professors aren't very good at this. Um, but we want to do it. Yeah, I, I would add, um, thank you for your comments. I don't really compare the present reality to 25 years ago, but 
I do compare it to 2000 years ago and things are great compared to <laughs> the first century. So much better. Um, as long as we're on John Polakowski's time. That's right. So in the long view, in the very long view, um, and from my particular space of Jewish Christian relations, who would have thought before 1965 that this reconciliation would have taken place, that the church would have utterly transformed its attitude towards not just the Jews, but other faith communities outside Side of itself. So I want to sort of imbue the radical optimism of Bernadine and say, you know, I'm worried about this year and I'm worried about next year, but I'm not worried for the long-term trajectory. Maybe we're going towards, uh, a, you know, in a good direction. However, I think that we haven't reckoned with this huge, massive behemoth of social media um, because I think most people are still good. And I think most people want to do the right thing. Maybe that's, you know, sort of delusional. I know that anti-Semitism is on the rise. I'm very scared to be a Jew in Chicago. I would have never said that a few years ago. Um, but bad people have a platform. Maybe I shouldn't say good people, bad people, but people who express social and religious hatred have a platform that they didn't have 25 years ago. And, um, and, and the spread of misinformation is very, very easy. And we're not talking about misinformation to a few dozen people. We're talking about misinformation to millions of people. And so to reckon with these platforms, it's, that's unprecedented. I mean, I don't know that we've ever had to do that. And I think that's going to take a very long time to figure out how to deal with, with these massive global platforms where you could do an enormous amount of damage. Let me build on that a little bit if I can, because I, I think you bring up social media and sort of the decline of the authoritative voice in public spaces. But I'm thinking of, of what Julie said as well, uh, which is that um, all of our faith traditions in this climate have a weakened voice and for different reasons. You know, certainly the Catholic Church has, we've visited our own problems upon ourselves to say whatever else and what other, other social forces are, are going on around uh, are going on around us. Uh, but, but in this uh, environment where we are competing with all sorts of platforms and all sorts of voices, the kind of authority that uh, religious traditions once had in our world, uh, like any other authority, uh, is it, it, it's tremendously diminished. So I, again, I sort of want to return us to the question, you know, it, it, is it enough, I'm wondering, to say um, that, that we just need to make the case better, that we just need to keep trying? Um, I, I think we're facing a particular kind of challenge here, and I, I, I want to, you know, very selfishly ask the panel. Uh, I've invited you all here to advise the Bernadine Center about the next 25 years and, and, and how we all can move forward, uh, not just here at CTU, but all together to try to, to work together on solutions to these problems as Catholics and with those outside the church as well. Um, you know, I, 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 I think this is important that we... we it's a crowded environment. It's an environment where no one is assumed to have authority. Um, what kinds of resources in this moment would, would you look to um, to help us reach out to those in the world uh, with whom we can work, even if we don't agree about everything? Easy questions. You should see what's in the chat, by the way. I am asking you easy <laughs> questions. I, I I think it's a difficult, um, a difficult project, obviously. Uh, but something that Julie said has been, I've been thinking about uh, since her presentation, asking people who might feel as if their identity or their rights uh, to be in dialogue with people they know or suspect want to curtail their rights or are opposed to their identity. That can be a traumatic experience, I think. Um, so in the church, finding common ground around issues, uh, contentious issues like human sexuality or uh, political ideology, that can be difficult. And I don't know what the, uh, creating that space where people won't feel as if their personhood is diminished by engaging in dialogue. That I think has to be a project that we think um, more seriously about. Um, I don't know what the answer to that is, however. <laughs> So that's okay. It's a tough question. Let me remind everybody who's with us uh, once again to please put your questions into the chat or to fill out those question slips. Uh, the first group of which are just reaching me here. Uh, and while I leaf through them, let me ask the question this way. 
Um, and, and I ask this as the director of a center who you know, has programs and all sorts of institutional things. And many of us work in environments like that. But I'm struck by something Gloria has said a couple of times. Maybe the mistake is to think of this as something that has a programmatic or an institutional answer. In the end, is this a, a matter of the spiritual lives of all of us uh, being refocused uh, in less fearful directions and in directions uh, perhaps more outward looking and, and more receptive, more listening? I firmly believe, oh, sorry, did Gloria want to say something? Gloria, go ahead. Okay. Well, I can, how can I step in when somebody starts with, I firmly believe? You go ahead. <laughs> go ahead, girl. <laughs> I was going to talk about cereal. Go ahead. I'll say it. It's coming. You know, I was thinking about, you know, how I grew up, actually. I grew up, um, I was converted to Catholicism on my own at age 12. I was from a multi-denominational family, Baptist, Methodist. Um, and how we got on, you know what I mean? With our very different um, practice of the faith. And then some in my family later on as you know, we got older and cousins came into the picture. Some stopped believing in God. Some were living what they might call alternative lifestyles. But yet what kept us together was our love for each other. You know, it's like, we just, it, we just loved each other. And I know that sounds simple, but that's something that Cardinal Bernadine reminded us that we are one human family, right? And so there has to be this love coming from us. And as a black person who's grown up in the South and knows the history of my family and the experience that we've had in such a hostile country, one of the things that kept us very positive is that we just simply rejected the lies about us. We could not be bothered with trying to convince other people of our worth because we we're too busy living you know what I mean? And making it. And so it wasn't my job per se to educate somebody else. Um, I, we firmly believe that white people have agency. They can learn if they want to. And also there's a role of people in their own community in helping them. Those people who already have a better grasp on the issue who can work in, within their own communities. And because they are within the community, they themselves can be heard. So there will be some work for what people might call allies to educate within their own community um, because I think their voices could be better heard by people in their community who are not yet understanding of particular issues. And so that was to your point, Michael, about talking with people who are actively working against your right to live. You know, it takes some of that burden off of the, the impacted community and puts it on that inter-community discussion, let's say among white people or around people who have the same sexual orientation or the same immigration status or whatever, to have these conversations, I think is gonna matter. And then one last thing, I will also say, I really believe that because the black community has been deeply spiritual, is why you know we haven't gone nuts and burned down this country, so to speak. So to remember to be rooted in our beliefs are gonna give us a kind of attachment to reality, reason, and love rather than fear, anxiety, and hatred. You know, if we detach ourselves from, from our beliefs in God and being in one human family, these things I think have to, we have to remember that and re, I guess, reaffirm that and keep ourselves rooted in that to be able to continue in these difficult conversations. But some of y'all gotta step up. That's the other thing too. Thanks, Gloria. Malka, what do you firmly believe? <laughs> okay, well, building on that, but I am gonna talk about cereal. Um, when it comes to top-down reconciliation, whether it's intra-religious or inter-religious, I believe that talking about, this is what I was gonna say, whether your favorite morning food is raisin bran or honey bunches of oats, that's as productive as theological discourse. I think very often we jump into the theological discourse and we want to solve all the big questions about truth, salvation, suffering, repentance, uh, but the trust hasn't been built. And so again, whether it's intra or inter, I think it's worth just sitting with one another and talking about, I need another metaphor because I think I've said cereal too many times, but I think that the trust really has to come before theology and their uh, top down reconciliation isn't always the best um, approach. 
And so sometimes um, it's that really grassroots level of just very basic friendship where the real change happens. So that's, I think, building on what you're saying. I wanted to pick up on that because I think that, that there's something to what both of you were saying about the spiritual foundation and about personal relationships and ordinary conversation. And yet I, I, there, it, there has to be this, this other space as well, and maybe not the top top, <laughs> um, and maybe not politics, and maybe not the most influential people who tend to be more firmly in either camp, but this other space, which is more communal or social or local, where we can work together on some of these issues. And that's where I think there actually have been great efforts in the last 25 years, not so much within the church, but I'm seeing in church and spaces outside the church where people are learning to have these uh, critical conversations, difficult dialogues, and uh, often around meals. <laughs> um, because people know, yeah, when you're sitting with food with people, uh, that's huge. And, and if we can cultivate those kinds of spaces with ordinary, um, Catholics who are in the parishes, Catholics who aren't in the parishes so much anymore, um, then I think we have, um, we have a chance to make progress on some of these issues. We're very fortunate that a lot of the questions have a lot of overlapping themes. And I'll ask the staff just to pass one more time through the room, and I'm still being fed questions here. But let me just sort of group a few of them together here. And uh, you'll, you'll expect that it, uh, all roads lead to Baltimore. Um, at least this week for Roman Catholics. Uh, a lot of people are asking uh, who in the church we can look to? Uh, who are the leaders in the church? And I, I wanna encourage everybody to include bishops, but look beyond them. Uh, who are the leaders in the Catholic church uh, who are successors to Cardinal Bernadine's sense of mission and ecclesial vision for the church? Uh, who is taking up uh, his most important priorities? Where can we look for leadership? I'll just give the obvious answer because someone's going to say it. Uh, so Pope Francis obviously is, I think, uh, the person who embodies best the spirit of both engaging the world and also uh, accompanying people who uh, feel cut off from the church. Um, however, I think the social media question comes back to the divisions within the church are exacerbated by social media. So even someone like the Pope who should be a unifying force in the church unfortunately becomes a contentious political office. And that will be the challenge. So even when you find a figure who should be um, a model for dialogue, how do you deal with the follow from uh, individuals who have a profit motive to sow division and uh, sow disunity in the church? Um, yeah, I think that's a, a social media question. I'll take one, I think. Uh, one example I think is great is the Initiative for Catholic Social Thought in Washington, D.C. I feel like they are really doing the dialogue piece better than most um, in really bringing people who um, from different sides together for productive conversations. That's at Georgetown, John Carr. Yes, Kim yes. Yeah, I agree. They're amazing. Um, but I would also say um, counterintuitively that in some, sometimes on Twitter, um, sometimes in social media spaces, there are productive conversations. And um, I'm writing a book right now on Catholicism and feminism. And there are some really interesting conversations going on. Um, I know, Gloria, you've had some, some um, uh, what I call new Orthodox Catholic feminists on your show. Um, I find them fascinating. And there are some interesting things happening that aren't happening, say, in academic spaces, where I think we're actually getting worse. We've had some questions. Uh, here's one that sort of represents a number of them. Uh, can we address Bernard in support for the movement draft on a pastoral on women uh, that the USCCB worked on for 10 years in the 80s that never came to full fruition? Uh, so there's some history here perhaps to talk about, but there's also a lot of unfinished business uh, from what George Weigel and others have called the Bernadine era. Uh, is, does anybody want to take a swing at that? <laughs> I've just said I'm writing on feminism, but um, yes, that, so I guess I was thinking about it actually in terms of um, your, your um, talk, 
Mike, about you know the, the pastorals on AIDS and how uh, I mean there are, there are you know sometimes there are documents that have a lot of uh, pieces and then there's then there's that one part that's that's important and 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 then there's the ongoing life of the of the documents or the things that didn't make it in but still were said and that was important. Um, so is there unfinished work for sure? Um, do we always want to go at it by going for another? pastoral letter? Um, does it need to come from the top down? I'm not, I'm not sure I'd start the conversation on women in the church there. <laughs> uh, we've had several questions here about, um, uh, and this uh, will pick up, uh, uh, this I suspect will require the repetition of a name we've heard already. We've had several questions here about uh, the upcoming Synod on Synodality. Uh, which seems like a natural fit uh, for this conversation about Cardinal Bernadine, uh, a church that Pope Francis is calling to walk together uh, at, down to the level of our local parishes uh, for every Catholic in the world, uh, theoretically, uh, at least to have her or his voice heard. Um, so I, I wonder, you know, uh, as we think about Cardinal Bernadine's legacy, how does it help us prepare for this synodal process? Uh, and yet at the same time, of course, I'd also want to ask, given that there's a considerable amount of division and hesitation in some parts of the church about the synodal process, uh, how do we deal with the irony uh, that this solution to the problem itself has gotten chewed up in the polarization that is the problem itself? Yeah, uh, so as a journalist, I, I'm trained and taught to be skeptical, and <laughs> I am skeptical of this uh, synod on synod synodality. Uh, for the simple reason, uh, in 2014, 2015, Pope Francis convened the system on the family and put up for debate really contentious issues that affect families all around the world. Uh, he said he wanted to talk about divorce and remarriage, about homosexuality, about parenting, about uh, the role of women in the church. It was a really, in 2014, it was a really momentous occasion for the church that you had a Pope encouraging these difficult conversations. 2015 came, the second round of meetings took place in Rome document came out and we kind of all moved on from it. So if you can't get Catholics excited about those topics, I don't know that a series of meetings about meetings is going to foster much excitement either. So that's my skeptical side. I am hopeful that I have seen groups of Catholics who historically haven't felt like they've been represented in the church see in this uh, series of meetings, this consultation process, a possibility for contributing and for uh, being heard. Uh, they see an, an ally in not only Pope Francis, but in this process that there is this desire for these experiences to be taken seriously by church leaders. So will it work? That's the skeptical side, but it is encouraging to see groups feel like they are finally having the opportunity to contribute after historically for decades not being invited to the table. Um, I had one experience last month in Germany. I was invited to some, um, where they're really taking the synodal process seriously. And I got to be a part of a group um, that was talking about the uh, women in the church. And there were some theologians there, but not, but mostly not. Mostly it was lay women and some men who were working on the ground. And they were just so impressive to me, um, hopeful and strong in their views. And, uh, and making paths forward, um, even when it didn't look like there should be paths. Uh, so, I mean, those kinds of conversations, um, which are also age diverse, which I was really excited about, um, give me hope. I, now I haven't seen that in my home diocese, um, but, um, but I know some, 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 in some places there are really good conversations happening. I like this way that uh, the question keeps coming back to, uh, you know, it's not another document, it's not another meeting. Uh, at a certain point, it's, it's, we've got to acknowledge our responsibility for the problem and our accountability to the solution. And, and it's one of the things that makes me want to put this uh, last question forward. It's the only one like it, uh, but I'm sort of intrigued by it, by the ways uh, that it might invite uh, the whole panel to think together. And I'm just going to read it. Uh, does our experience with Jewish Catholic dialogue, and I would, I would uh, extrapolate beyond that to say interreligious dialogue more generally, uh, but a dialogue that's been underway for quite a while and that predates this era of polarization we're in, does our experience with this dialogue 
since Nostra Aetate uh, suggest any lessons or analogies that can be applied to anti-racism and decolonizing work today. In other words, is, is the template really there? And I'm, I'm thinking about this, you know, Mike, in the way that you talk particularly about a, a public facing church, a public role for the church and something critical that's lost when the church's voice isn't present. Um, can we learn something from the ways that we've succeeded and failed in interreligious work about how we can turn that voice toward the public? Um, if I may, the question is a great question and it also concerns me because I worry that encountering Jews and Judaism as a lesson, as a symbol, as something that is representative of something else doesn't often turn out well for the Jews. So I would like to reframe this very good and important question by thinking about how all of us can encounter those interlocutors that are in other faith communities on their own self-defined terms. Um, and so thinking about it that way invites Jewish interlocutors or Muslim or any other faith community to um, enter into dialogue in spaces wherein inequities are recognized and those distinctive aspects are foregrounded of each community. So there's a famous Jewish thinker, um, a rabbi and philosopher named Rabbi Joseph Soloveitchik who called the Jewish Christian dialogue, the community of the many in relation to the community of the few. Uh, because the, the nature of this dialogue, the word implies some kind of equal ground, but it really isn't an equal relationship. There are 14 million Jews in the whole world. Half of them are in Israel, half of them are in the United States. There's a constant existential anxiety that Jews have always and going into dialogue spaces accentuates the sense of vulnerability that many Jews have. The Holocaust just happened a second ago. Um, and so I would just say that recognizing the unique nature of every dialogue relationship has to be step one. Uh, rather than to say, what lessons can we extrapolate from the Jewish Christian relation? I, of course you could, you could extrapolate lessons, but please begin by taking it on its own, on its own terms and then um, taking other relationships on their own terms with their unique histories as well. Any other thoughts on that panel? Well, I would say that if I, I appreciate your point, absolutely. Now I'm afraid to take a lesson. No, but, but, uh, <laughs> but if I can take a lesson. <laughs> um, so my, I have uh, three sons in their twenties and, and I would say that the common ground aspect of my work is their least favorite thing that I do. Um, they, they don't see um, how sometimes, how, how do you talk to people like that? Um, who, people who hold views um, against people that I love, um, people, you know. So, so what, what's the point really? And, and I think that this offers us a, um, a model because you could, there's a way to say, I can't go with you there, <laughs> but I know there are other pieces of you that and, and what you hold um, dear that, that I can connect with. It's not, this piece of you is not all of you. And, um, and I think that's, that's really helpful and it allows us to be in conversations with, with people that it's really hard to be in conversation with um, for deeply, not just because of distaste, but for really good reasons, right? That for things that we care deeply about. Yeah. This reminds me- Gloria. Uh, yeah, this reminds me actually of a book by um, Eli Saslow, I think. He's written about Derek Black who was a young man that grew up in Stormfront and father total, I mean, these people were white supremacists, completely anti-Semitic, it was just nuts. And he went to college and this Jewish man, after he was added to the college community as, as having this uh, radio program with Stormfront and spouting these anti-Semitic racist views, this Jewish man invited him to dinner every Friday night. And the condition of coming to the dinner being invited is that they were not to talk politics. And so it was through this relationship with this Jewish man that Derek Black had come to discover the error of how he was reared. I mean, he was homeschooled. He was just brought up in this movement. He was the heir to this white supremacist anti-Semitic movement 
in the United States. And as a young man through friendship with this Jewish man and then some of the other college students that were able to bracket their rage and come in and just meet with him as a person, were able to through that friendship and actually saying, when he was like, we're not anti-Semitic. And he would, they would listen to some of the things that he would say at, at conferences, at these Stormfront conferences or whatever. And then through friendship, they were able to pose the questions to him. And it was hearing from these people who were his friends that made him start to see, well, gosh, yeah, I could see how that could sound anti-Semitic. Oh, oh yes, yeah, see, and, and, and this guy had this conversion, if you will. He completely broke with that, broke with his family from this and is now studying history somewhere, getting a PhD somewhere in history and is completely broken from the movement. But what was special about it is they didn't come in yelling at him or angry at him or even talking about the things in which they didn't agree, but instead it was meeting around a meal and just common friendship, which I think is, not everybody's called to do that. I mean, if I were, I would be afraid of this person, frankly. So not everybody's called to do that, but those who think they can, let's give them that <laughs> work. I mean. Beautiful story. Mm -hmm. I think there again, we come back to the theme, uh, dear friends and neighbors. Uh, here today, as we remember uh, and celebrate Cardinal Joseph Bernadine, uh, who showed us the way uh, that it is for us to continue walking. Uh, it is in fact for you uh, and for me. Uh, to continue this uh, journey of encounter and dialogue that leads to reconciliation, ultimately to peace. Uh, so I'm very pleased that we've been able to bring the conversation to that conclusion. Would you please express uh, with me our appreciation for the whole panel? One last thing, uh, when Cardinal Bernadine returned to the United States from Jerusalem after his historic journey in 1995, he returned with a determination to begin to build friendships with Chicago's growing Muslim community, uh, to expand the scope of interreligious dialogue. He didn't live long enough to do that. But since 2000, uh, we have done that here at CTU in the Bernadine Center with our Catholic Muslim Studies program. Uh, and in the spirit of that expanding sphere of dialogue, I want to invite CTU graduate, Mohammed Aslan, to offer prayer to close out our panel conversation. Mohammed. Salam, shalom, peace and greetings. It's an honor and privilege to be here, to be part of this program. Uh, I will recite some verses of the Quran and share some words of prayer for honoring the great soul, his eminence, Cardinal Joseph Bernardin. <laughs> يا أيها الناس إنا خلقناكم من ذكر وأنثى وجعلناكم شعوبا وقبائل لتعارفوا إِنَّ أَكْرَمَكُمْ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ أَتْقَاكُمْ إِنَّ اللَّهَ عَلِيمٌ خَبِيرٌ بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين In the name of God whose essence is compassion and who shows compassion to all all humankind, 
Indeed, we have created you from male and female and made you tribes and nations that you may know one another. Indeed, the most noble of you in the sight of God is the most righteous of you. Indeed, God is all-knowing and all-aware. All praise belongs to God, the nurturing sustainer of the universe, whose essence is compassion and who shows compassion to all. Sovereign of the judgment day, you alone do we worship and you alone do we seek help. Guide us on the straight path, the path of those upon whom you bestow your grace, not of those who incur your anger, nor of those who go astray. Let us pray. Eternal God, creator of the universe, there is no God but you. Great and wonderful are your works. Wondrous are your ways. Thank you for the many splendid variety of your creation. Thank you for the many ways we affirm your presence and purpose and the freedom to do so. O oh God, unite our hearts and set aright our mutual affairs. Guide us in the path of peace. Liberate us from darkness by your light. Save us from enormities, whether open or hidden. Forgive our violation of your creation. Forgive our violence towards each other. We stand in awe and gratitude for your persistent love for each and all of your children, Christians, Jews, Muslims, as well as those with other faith. Grant to all and our leaders attributes of the strong mutual respect in words and deeds, restrained in the exercise of power and the will for peace with justice for all. Reunite us in bonds of love and work through our struggle and the confusion to accomplish your purposes on earth. Bless us in our ears, in our eyes, hearts, pauses, and children. Turn to us, truly you are the most merciful. Make us grateful for your bounty and full of praise for it so that we may continue to receive it and complete your blessings upon us. As Cardinal Bernard then reminded us, God's special gift to us all, the gift of peace. Oh God, let us be at peace and let us find the freedom to be most fully who we are, even in the worst of times. Let us go of what is non-essential and embrace what is essential, O oh God. We empty ourselves so that you may more fully work within us and we become instruments in the hands of the Lord. Amen. Thank you.